All right, so this is the sixth class of Shara Bitochen. We just finished in the previous class going through our top ten list of ways in which one who trusts in Hashem is better than an alchemist. And uh, now we're going to continue. Now we're continuing. And we're going to talk about how Bitochen affects somebody in terms of monetary matters. You know, money is one of those uh, issues that affects everybody. Everybody has to deal with money. Our sages, actually, they say, uh, why is money called a zuz? The Jews, when the majority of the scholarship was in Babylonia, so the big currency back then was the, uh, the zuz. You know, we say in the Chad Gadya, right, the goat that he bought with the zuzim. So they used to say, uh, why is it called a zuz? Why? Because it makes people move. Zuz also means move. Money is a mover. Mon money is a shaker. Okay, so we're going to talk about money. Let's talk about money. All right? Fine. Another advantage of trust in Hashem in respect to religious life is that he who trusts in Hashem, if he has means, if he has money, will hasten to meet his monetary obligations to God and to man. He mentions Two kinds of monetary obligations, to God and to man. What does that mean? Well, first of all, let's just finish translating. With a willing soul and a generous spirit. There are two kinds of monetary obligations. There is like religious stuff, you know, buying a nice esrug. Um, you know, kosher food is expensive. Uh, tuition is expensive, right? Okay, so those are the extra monetary obligations one has to God. And then there's stuff that you have uh, to man. So, you know, somebody once told me, he says, you know, mitzvahs are expensive. And esrog is expensive. Kosher food is expensive. Leisignov is expensive. <laughs> Leisignov is an expensive mitzvah, right? Things are much cheaper if you don't pay for them. At any rate, but what we, what we mean is obligations... Mon monetary obligations to man, we're talking about charity. Except, really, we shouldn't even say charity. Charity is, a, is an English word. We should say tzedakah. Tzedakah is tzedek, is righteousness. Tzedakah isn't charity. Charity is chesed. Charity means the kindness of your own heart. You don't have to do it. You're being a nice guy. Tzedakah means it's only right. It's only right. It's only the fair thing that you should give money to others. And, you know, there's, there's an old uh, story about a, a beggar who comes to the door and he asks the balabas for some money and the balabas is very, he's begrudging, he doesn't want to give him anything. So the beggar, I guess, was a little bit eloquent, a little bit of a baldarshan, or at least <laughs> when a baldarshan tells stories about beggars, the beggars are all eloquent, okay? Anyways, so, um, so the beggar says to the, to the balabas, he says, you know, balabas, he says, uh, you know, Meiser Behema, you know, in the old days, people used to have livestock, they used to have uh, animals. You know how you do the tithe of the animal? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing. You have to stand there, and you make a little opening in the pen, and they run out, and you count each one. One, there goes one. Two, there goes, there goes three, there goes four, there goes five, there goes six, there's seven, eight, nine. And then the tenth little Shepsula who runs out, you, 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 put, you put the paint on him. Ten, and that's the Asiri, and that's Kodesh, and that becomes a, a Korban. So the, 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 the beggar says to the Balabas, he's like, I don't understand. Nobody knows math. Nobody knows how to divide by ten. Go out into your flock and count however you have a thousand sheep. Okay, so divide by ten. A hundred of them have to be my behema. He says, no. But Hashem knew that that would be too hard for the Balabas. It would be too hard. Like, we have giving away a hundred sheep. A hundred sheep I'm going to give away. That's too much. So rather, what does what Taira do? Psychologically, it makes it so much easier for you. 
You count them one at a time. Say, there's one for me. There's two for me. There's three for me. There's four for me. There's five for me. There's six for me. There's seven for me. There's eight for me. There's nine for me. Okay, ten. Let Hashem have his tenth, right? Give that to the poor. So, tzedakah, tzedek, justice means, I have so much, it's only right that I don't keep it all. Okay? So a person who has bitachen is going to be able to cheerfully discharge his monetary duties, both in terms of spending money on religious things, that means between him and Hashem, as well as uh, the duties that we have to our, to our fellow, to be philanthropic. By the way, you know why they call it in Yiddish, a, ph a philanthropist is called a philanthrop. You know why it's called a philanthrop? Okay, anyways, let's continue. The im bal Now, what about if he's not wealthy? We were saying before, if he has a lot of money, he's going to realize this is all Hashem's money, and there's no problem. He doesn't have to hoard it. He doesn't have a scarcity mentality. He has no problem parting with it. What if he doesn't have money? Not, not everyone with talking has money. Okay, so what if he doesn't have money? If he doesn't have money, he will view his lack of money as a favor that Hashem did for him. Because now he's free from the obligations he would have had to, to Hashem and his fellow because of the money. So now he doesn't have the money, he doesn't have those problems. Okay. That's a simple way to not have to uh, deal with making sure you're giving enough tzedakah and spending enough money on the right things. You just don't have any money. That's my financial plan, by the way. I can solve all your financial plan, uh, problems. Okay. Um, Another benefit, if he doesn't have money, is he doesn't really have worry about keeping his money or you know uh, what to do with it. Like it says, Al There's a story about one of the pious people. Rebbeinu Bachai is telling a story about a, a, a chosid. This pious guy, he used to say, He says, Hashem saved me from pizer. Pizer and nefesh means, you know what the pazer is in, in Trop, in Tamiya Mikra? Pazer. It's all shaky. It's all over the place. It's scattered. Pizer and nefesh means a scattered nefesh. So he says, there was a poor guy, he didn't have a lot of money, and he says, you know what? Hashem is kind. Hashem saved me from Pizer and Nafish. Why? Amrulai, they said to him, Mahu Pizer and Nafish, what do you mean? What's 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 distraction? Amr, he said to them, if I would have money in every port and in every city, that would be Pizer and Nafish. I would have to keep track of all these uh, these enterprises. This is precisely what our sages have told us, what Chazal tell us. The more property you have, the more possessions you have, the more worry you have. Yeah. Uh, and they also have said, who's, who's wealthy, who's truly wealthy? A person who's happy with his lot, who's happy with whatever he has. Okay, so the person who has bitachin, if he has a lot of money, he's not afraid of spending it. You know, those people who have a pathology that, that, of holding on to money, they can't spend it, they can't part with it. It's, it's a sickness. So if he has a lot of money and he's a Baba talking, he's not going to have those problems. And conversely, if he doesn't have a lot of money, he's going to be okay with that too. In fact, he'll be relieved about it. They'll say, oh, Hashem did me a favor. Okay. Bashem. <laughs> Yasig Tayelis Hamamain, one who trusts in Hashem, will obtain the advantage of money. Meaning he'll get the real the real benefit that money actually offers. Ritsaini Laimar, what I mean to say is Parnasase, to be able to sustain himself. But he'll be spared the mental distractions of one who has money and constantly worries about it. So, you know, some people have money, and the money itself is it's, it's not a blessing. It's, it's a distraction. It becomes a focus unto itself, and uh, it becomes a preoccupation. Having the money, checking on the money, checking their portfolio, how are my investments doing, uh, how's the market, 
And uh, so this guy who has been talking, he has money, he has what he needs, but he doesn't think about it. It's not a fixation for him, which, you know, the best of both worlds. You have what you need and you, you're not, you don't focus on it. Okay. Kamesha Amar Achacham, like the wise man said, who is the wise man? The wisest of all men, Shleim HaMelech, King Solomon. Mesuka shnas ha'eved im ma'at v'im harba yechel. V'hasava la'asher enenu meniach le'lishay. Sweet is the sleep of the laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the prosperity of the rich man does not let him sleep. What was Shleim HaMelech saying? What, what is this saying that requires the wisdom of Solomon? Saying basically the psychological difference between an employee and a balabas. An employee, at the end of the day, you know, he shows up, he works in good faith, meaning, you know, doesn't slack off. He does the job he was told to do. But it, it, at the end of the day, it's not his responsibility to make sure that, you know, that everything gets done and that the business stays afloat and he doesn't bring it home with him. And you know, he, he does what he's supposed to do, but it's, it's, not, his, it's not his problem. Um, the Balabas, on the other hand, he, he has a very hard time separating himself psychologically from, from the business. So, you know, at the end of the day, he tries to go to sleep and he's still thinking about the business. Even if they did well today, he's still thinking about the business. And then the, the employee, he's able to sleep, doesn't bring it home with him. Now, it's funny because you have employees who have a balabas mentality and you have a balabas who has an employee ma- a mentality. You have people this, <laughs> who are workers, they don't have a share in the company and they bring it home with them. Nabuch, they bring it home with them. But then you have a balabas who, it's his business, but it's not his business. You know why? Because he has bitochen, he knows it's really Hashem's business. So Hashem's the real balabas. And therefore, even though he owns the business, he has more of an employee mentality, which is you don't bring it home with you. You know, you, you come home, you walk through the door, and that's it. You're, you're able to focus on, on, on your family, and you don't worry about the business. And comes Shabbos, you're not thinking about the business. Comes two days of Yom Tov, you're not worrying about the business. Three day Yom Tov, you're not worrying about the business. Um, because it's not on you. If you have betach and you realize it's Hashem's business. Okay, let's continue. Umehen. Further advantages. Ki habayteach b'ashem loy yimno enu roi v'amamein mibteach b'ashem. Another advantage is, is uh, another advantage is that one who trusts in Hashem won't be hindered in his trust by wealth. Mibnei she'enenu semech alamamein because he doesn't rely on the wealth anyways. He's not emotionally secure based on his bank account. That's not what his sense of security and well-being comes from. His sense of security and well-being comes from Hashem. So therefore, the money doesn't do anything from other than, you know, paying bills. You, you, you don't pay bills with trust. You don't pay bills with emotional well-being. Okay, the emotional well-being is for you. When you have to pay the bills, you need money. Okay, fine, so you need money. But that's the point. That's all that money is to him. It's just a way of paying bills. It's not a source of emotional security. For so many people, especially, I'll be sexist for a moment here, but for men. And by the way, where does this come from? This comes from the curse, Odom and Chava, that Chava was cursed with, with the Tsar Yilubonim and with, 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 with carrying the child and giving birth to the child. And, uh, and the man was cursed with Bezeya Sapecha, Teichel, that you're going to have to eat by the sweat of your brow, which basically means that men have a problem identifying way too much with their career and with their responsibility as a breadwinner. And, and, and that's the point, is that when you put so much emotional stock in your conduit for Parnassa, it's just, it's just not healthy. Um, and so the Baal Betochen, what's great about his situation is that even when he has money, that's not giving him anything emotionally. It's just a practical thing. It's just, it's just money to, to pay bills with. That's it. It doesn't have any deeper meaning for him or any emotional meaning to him. Okay. The way he looks at his money is that it's just a deposit which he's been commanded to use in certain ways for certain purposes for a limited time. 
He's not attached to it. It's not even his. It's just, it's passing through his hands right now. Ve'im yasmid kiyumai atzlai. And let's say the money stays by him for a long time. Let's say he does well in business and he continues doing well and he continues having a lot of money. So it's not just it's passing through his life. Let's say he's wealthy for a long period of time. Loi yivat bavurai. He won't grow rebellious because of it. You know, one of the problems with money is they can make a person rebellious because he starts to think, look at me, I'm a hotshot, I made money. And people treat me differently. You know, that's what happens. People make money and everybody treats you like, uh, like something special. You know about the rich man who lost his fortune and he was, he was bemoaning his situation. He says, you know, I understand now that I lost all my money that nobody comes to me anymore for tzedakah. But why did they stop coming to me for advice? <laughs> Everybody used to come to the rich man for advice. You know, we'd really like to have you take a look at this plan. What do you think about this plan, right? They don't want his advice. They, they want to rope him into to being the, the, the donor, to being the supporter. Okay, so people treat rich people in a certain way, and it plays with their head, and, 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 and it can cause all types of, of personality issues. But the Baal Bittachin, he doesn't look like he doesn't look at it like it's his money anyways. So even if he continues having money for a long period of time, he doesn't identify with it, and therefore he doesn't become arrogant. It doesn't change him. It doesn't change his personality. Also, an interesting thing about him is he doesn't remind the recipients of his charity of the kindness that he's done for them. He doesn't even look for recognition. Rather, he thanks Hashem. That he got to be an agent of kindness. Because it's not his money, so he doesn't identify with it. It's not him. So he doesn't think to himself, well, you know, that guy owes me how I helped him out, how I was... So, so generous toward him. He doesn't think about it that way. He thinks about it like, look, you know, I had the money. It passed through my hands. I'm lucky. I'm fortunate that when Hashem wanted to sustain so-and-so, that he used me as a, as a conduit to deliver, to deliver those funds. So he, he's just grateful for it. He doesn't think anyone should thank him. To the contrary, he's thankful. Okay. Let's say he loses his money. Could happen, right? We were saying it's just passing through. He just has access to it for now. What happens if he loses access to the money? People lose fortunes. He will not grieve or mourn his loss. What did he lose? <laughs> Nothing that he had. It was never his to begin with. Ach, rather, who made it, he gives thanks, lelekov, to his God, bikachte pikdaine mi itoi, when Hashem takes the deposit back, kasher hoide benisinose loi, just like he thanked Hashem when he gave him the deposit. Ve yismach bechelkei ve anene mevakesh hezek lezulose, and he's happy with his lot, he doesn't seek damage to anyone else. You know, people who have that real strong emotional attachment to their wealth and they get their identity from that and they, they, they get a false sense of security from that. So one of the things that automatically happens is that they find themselves begrudging other people's financial security. And, you know, there's that scarcity mentality. If this guy's getting rich, oh, then maybe, you know, there won't be enough for me. And uh, the person who has bitachin, he doesn't have that feeling. It uh, never occurs to him that it should bother him that somebody else has money. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a deeper concept here as well, which is the idea of ein odem negea beparnasase shel chaveroi. Nobody touches somebody else's livelihood. And, and really what that means is our livelihood has our name on it. As much as we think we have to go around and gather it up and it becomes ours because we went out and we made it and we acquired it, it's not so. It's not so. The, the livelihood that's meant for us was already allotted to us and therefore nobody else can take anybody else's parnosa. Oh, but he, he, got, he, 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 
he was Masig Gvul and he competed with me and he stole my customers and you know and, and all those things are Avedas and that's between him and Hashem. He's gonna have to do tshuva for that, but it didn't cost you a penny. I promise you, it didn't cost you a penny. If 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 it wouldn't have if you wouldn't have lost it that way, you would have lost it another way. Nobody can take your money because ultimately it was allotted to you and, and you get every cent that's coming to you. Okay. So therefore, he's not, he's not jealous of anyone. He doesn't covet anyone else's property. It's not mine, so it's not for me. So why would I want it? Like the wise man said, the wise man again, a righteous man eats only until he's satisfied. In other words, I only need what I need. It doesn't hurt me, not even emotionally, to see other people prospering. It's not a threat. There's no scarcity mentality. Ah, Now we're talking about a related concept, the benefits of trust in Hashem in this world. A heart at rest, free of worldly cares. And an undisturbed and untroubled, um, he, he, he will be undisturbed and untroubled by lack of bodily gratification. He'll have a sense of calm and security and peace in this world. Kamesha Kosov, like it says, like the prophet Yirmiya says, Blessed is the man who trusts in Hashem, and Hashem will be his trust. And furthermore, it says, this person who trusts in Hashem, he's like a tree planted by water that, send that sends out its roots by the stream. So he's not a reactive person. He's not a person whose emotional state is tied into the ups and downs of life. He's got an emotional stability. He's even keel. He's not going up and down based on the vicissitudes of life. Let's continue. Another advantage is the soul's release from the need to set out on long journeys. What's wrong with long journeys? It consumes the body and shortens, one, and shortens one's life. Yeah, travel is... It, Really beats up your body, taking it, having to travel all over the place is, uh, is exhausting. It's depleting. Kameshinema, like it says, to heal him. Ina vaderech keichi kitsa yomai. He weakened my strength on the way, meaning during travel. He shortened my days. So the Baal Betochen is not going to have to run around traveling in order to go get money. The Nemar, it's told. Rabbeinu Bechai is going to tell us a story. Al echod min haprushim about an ascetic, a potash, someone who separates himself from the world. Ki holach al eretz rechei lavakish haterif betchilas prishusai. He went to a far off land at the beginning of his period of prishus. He went before he became an ascetic. He went to some far off land. An idol worshiper came over to him in the city where he was, where he was supposed to make some money. So some idol worshiper came over to him and started, he struck up a conversation with him. Amalaya So uh, the Potash said to this idol worshiper, Kama atem betachlas. How blind you are, how foolish you are to, to serve idols. He was, he was going to regret that he started up with this idol worshiper because this idol worshiper was, uh, you're going to see. Amarlai Huangushi. So this idol worshiper says back, he gave him a zinger. 
give him a zinger. He says, Umo ato oived, and what do you serve? You're making fun of me because you know the Avedis Kechovim, the idol worshiper. Okay, sir, what do you serve? Amar Leia Potash. So the Potash told him, Ani oived habeira hayochel, hamachalkel o echod, hamatrif asher ein kameu. I worship the omnipotent creator, the one provider and supporter. There is nothing like him. Amaloyam Gushi. So then the idol worshiper said to him, your actions contradict your words. <laughs> You're not from here. You came from far away to make some money over here. Apparently what you just said, that you worship the one provider, isn't so true. Because you left your home, you didn't think he could provide for you over there, and you came all the way over here. Your, your actions contradict your words. Amalaya Parish. So the Parish was a little bit thick. So he, he says, Hey, how so? How so? How, how, how do my actions contradict my words? Amalaya, he told him, If what you just told me is true, He would have sustained you in your town just like he's supposed to be sustaining you over here, whatever business you think you have over here. And you wouldn't have to come to this faraway land. He had nothing to retort. Like his, his answer dried up. He had nothing to say. And he just went home. After that zinger, he just he turned around he turned around and went home. The kibble. Haprishus mina esahi. From that moment, he accepted upon him the precious v'leyotzem irei achakach, and he never left his city again. Okay, it's interesting. Over here, Reb Yankov Emden asks, "Isn't it possible there are legitimate reasons why why even a balbitochen might have to travel, might have to leave home, even in order to make a living?" And in fact, Reb Yankov Emden says that this was his situation. He said that he had to move because of Parnassah, and, and that this could be the will of Hashem, that you move because of Parnassah. In fact, he, he brings the Gemara, Bava Metzia, uh, Daf Ayin uh, Hei Base, which says over there that a person who doesn't have Parnassah should travel to another city. So what, 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 what is Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar saying over here? So Rabbi Yankov Emden explains like this. He gives three reasons why a person might have to travel. Even though he has betochen, even though Hashem ostensibly could provide for him in his in his place where he already is, like the zinger from the from the idol worshiper. Uh, so he says three reasons. One is maybe because of his sins, the Baal betochen won't be zeiche. He won't merit to get his parnasa uh, right where he is, and he's going to have to go travel for it. Another reason might be because actually the people in his town are not good people; they're immoral people, and Hashem wants to get him out of there. So he. Gets him out of there by making him get a job offer in another city. He has to relocate. Uh, and then the third reason, he says, is it might be an Asayan. It might just purely be an Asayan. Hashem is trying him, is testing him to, to bring him to a higher level. Um, so those are, those are a couple of explanations. I'll add, before we finish up here tonight, I'll add one more explanation, which is sort of similar to the second explanation of Rabbi Yankov Emden, but a little bit different, a little bit more Hasidic, and, and, it, and it's a story. So I'm going to give you a Hasidic Shavort with, within a Hasidic Shemaisa, and uh, you'll forgive me for going a little bit over time. The Maisa is as a, that there was one time a watchmaker, a Jewish watchmaker, in the town of Polotsk, and he couldn't make a living. So he went to the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, known as the Rebbe Marash. Yerem Shmuel, the seventh and youngest son of the, the Tzemach Tzedek, and the, the successor of the Tzemach Tzedek. So this Chassid went to, uh, actually I don't know if he was a Chassid, a Jew. Many, many Jews went to the, the Rebbe and for brachas. So this Jew goes to the, this watchmaker, this Jewish watchmaker, he goes to the Rebbe Marash, and he tells him, I don't have any parnasa in Polotsk, in the town where I live, uh, but I heard there's a small town a remote place where they don't have any watchmakers, and uh, I'm thinking I should move there, and then I could I could make money and support my family. 
So the Rebbe Marash tells him, you should go. And he gives him a bracha that he should go, he should be matzliach. So he goes to this town. Uh, the name of the town is Vladimir. So he goes to the town. And uh, the thing is like this. It's not a real Jewish community. In fact, I should have mentioned this. When he's in the Yechidus with the Rebbe Marash, he mentions the fact he's going to uproot his family from uh, a place with a normal Jewish community to this other place where they don't have a normal Jewish community. What did they have, actually? Cantonists. Families of Cantonists. These were these young men who were forced into military conscription who were uprooted from their Judaism. And all they knew about Judaism is that they were beaten up for being Jews and discriminated against, but they, 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 they couldn't read Aleph base. They didn't know how to make brachas. They didn't, they didn't have basic Jewish, Jewish education. And, and so he was saying, you know, I'm going to a place with no Jewish resources. And, and, but there's Parnosa, or at least the prospect of Parnosa there, and the Rebbe Marash gave him a bracha as you go. At any rate, so he went, he went to that place. A year later, he goes back to Lubavitch. He did the right thing, this part of it. He did the right thing, which is to, to give thanks to the Rebbe for the bracha. So he goes back to Lubavitch, and he, he goes into Yechidus with the Rebbe Marash, and he says, I want to thank the Rebbe for the bracha. Everything worked out perfectly. I went to this town, Vladimir, and I'm making money hand over fist. The watchmaking, there's no other watchmakers. I'm the only watchmaker. I'm making lots of money, Baruch Hashem. It's really good. So um, the Rebbe Marash says to him, and how is your learning with the illiterate families, the Cantonists and their, their descendants? Learning, well, what are you talking about? He says, well, they're illiterate. They can't read Aleph base. You can. How's the learning going with those, with those Jews? So he says, Rebbe, hold, hold on, hold on a second. Hold on a second. First of all, that's not what I went to Vladimir for. But second of all, I should explain what my life is like over there. I'm busy. I, Baruch Hashem, business is good. I'm busy with my watchmaking. Okay? And to top it all off, because, precisely because they're all ignoramuses and they don't know anything, they have a shul, but they can't daven. Nobody there can daven. They can't, they can't, they can't read from a siddur. So I'm the chaz in every tefillah. And then, when it comes to Kriya Satayra, who's Baal I, I, I have to read the Torah, because they, they can't read uh, a Pasuk Chumash. And uh, so, I have to do all of that stuff, and whatever my own shiurim, whatever my own uh, Kriya Sita, my own uh, you know, learning sessions that I keep. And on top of all that, I'm supposed to study Aleph base with these guys who are, you know, these Cantonists and, and, and their families and their children. So, no, it doesn't really happen. So the Rebbe Marash says to him, he says, Oi, you think that Hashem couldn't give you Parnassah in Polotsk? That the Eivishter who sustains the entire world had to send you to another town just to be able to give you the funds to, to feed your family? Of course the Eivishter could have fed you in the town where you came from. The only reason, the whole purpose why Hashem put your Parnosa in another town was only to bring you over there so that you would learn with those Cantonists and their family and teach them Aleph base. It wasn't for the money. If you think, the Rebbe Marash says, that you move, that you go, you relocate because of money, you lack a mona. We don't relocate because of money. We relocate because of a shlichus, because of a holy mission that we have, some type of benefit that we have to do, something holy we have to do in that place. At any rate, that's similar to what Rabbi, Rabbi Yankiv Emden was saying, that he wanted to get him out of the place where he was because the people there weren't moral. This is a little bit more positive. This is saying he wants to get him to another place because he could be uh, a mashpia, he could influence and help the people in that other place. But again, it's not about the money, and it's not that Hashem couldn't sustain you in that place. Of course Hashem could sustain you in the place where you already are, but he uses the money to, like we said, zuz means to move. He uses the money to pick you up, to move you to that place, but it's not because he needed to put you there in order to, to give you the money. It's he used the money to get you over there because he needed you to do the mitzvah, to do something for somebody else, to be of benefit to, uh, to another Jew or many other Jews. Okay, thank you very much for tonight, and we'll see you all, God willing, tomorrow night.